I'm Niels Ventilin. Um, welcome to the Union Flight Workshop. Um, today, I'll be giving a workshop about learning your code base, fine tuning Code Llama with flight to learn flight. Um, I'm hoping that this workshop will be informative enough for you to be able to reason about at least and start building your own fine tuned large language models. Um, I chose this particular application just because it's a little bit meta and pretty fun. So um, yeah, let's get started. So who am, I, who am I? I am the chief ML engineer at Union AI. Union AI is a AI infrastructure company that's helping organizations get value out of their data um, by building and supporting AI-driven applications. Um, I'm also the creator of Pandera, a data validation tool, and more recently, Union ML, which is an MLOps framework. I'm also the core maintainer of Flight, um, which is the orchestration tool that I'll be using today to fine tune my models. Um, my background is in biology and public health. I'd like to share this because uh, I just wanna highlight how you know, maybe a lot of you in the audience here and maybe watching the recording um, may not necessarily come from a computer science and math background. So just wanna add a little bit of a data point there for, for that kind of perhaps non-traditional background. My mission these days is to help build open source tools for data science and machine learning practitioners. Um, I have been a data scientist in the past. Currently, I kind of, I guess, don the title of ML engineer, um, but I see these two things and beyond, right? Like data engineering and, and more as very much intertwined and um, it's all about the responsibilities and sort of uh, what your organization needs at a particular time um, that lends credence to various responsibilities and, and roles. Okay, so unless you've been living under a rock, you will probably know that LLMs are really hot right now. Um, they are a very promising paradigm and uh, going beyond language, transformers are a promising architecture that um, I think supports many different data modalities, um, not just text, but video and image and audio. Um, so I'd be curious what future architectures are like, but, but right now, in the here and now, um, you know, we're here in MLOps world where we want to learn about AI and machine learning. Um, this talk will dive deeper into how you kind of build AI ML products. So you might have seen this blog post um, called the Rise of the AI Engineer. Um, this is kind of a nice little graphic to show you where this relatively new job title fits into the existing stack. Um, you know, when I saw this title at first, I, I kind of like maybe had a slightly negative reaction of like, why do we need a new title? Uh, but you know, when you think about it, uh, data scientists are statisticians with different tools, right, and different sets of concerns. So um, AI engineers, you know, one way of look at, looking at them are they are software engineers with different sets of tools, um, and hopefully that justifies sort of like these. Um, kind of job title, marketing, branding changes of these kinds of roles. So going kind of building off of this idea of, uh, okay, we have this kind of powerful new tool that we can use for very different kind of flexible use cases from information retrieval um, to language generation to various other use cases. I wanna think about not just machine learning and AI models themselves, but what are, the, what are the, the software systems and what are the products that we build on top of it? So another way to reason about um, the space today is just building off of the previous slide and, and blog post, right? ML research, in ML research, 
there, there's kind of like this four, at least four tier stack in the, in the AI product stack. So the very bottom, there's ML research. There is, uh, and this is where you look at models as optimization outputs. Then you have ML engineering, which views models as weights, weights that you need to package up, weights that you need to deploy to serve on some kind of endpoint, weights that you can fine tune uh, on custom data sets. So that's where I sort of see ML engineering. And on top of that, we have AI engineering, which views models as functions. So you don't care too much about the internals or the implementation details. Most of what you care about is the inter input output interface and the behavior, like how good is the output and does it enable um, the last layer, which is AI product design, which is essentially kind of a, a tongue in cheek way models as magic. So models as these um, product user experience components that would not have otherwise been possible without, say, GPT-4 or, you know, pick your, you know, favorite open source language model. Um, and this applies not just to LLMs, but other things like generative, uh, other generative models like um, um, stable, stable diffusion, diffusion models, um, and perhaps other older school, more traditional machine learning models. But, you know, there's a lot of tools and frameworks out there now. And I think the standards and the best practices are just, are still forming and um, building these products are, are quite hard because if we consider this stack of four, you know, things, it's, it's, it spans a lot of different, um, expertise and skill sets. So the point of this talk is that, you know, I know there's a, a retrieval augmented generation is, is very hot and um, all the space around that and, and treating models as functions is, is a very worthy um, direction to go and to develop. But I would say, I guess, as an ML engineer and former data scientist, I think it's important to build these models, not, not exactly from scratch, but picking up a part that you would like to hone in on and build yourself. So um, one thing I've found useful is that it's good to build LLM powered uh, developer tools so that you're a user. So we are all coders, programmers, and um, it makes sense that a lot of many of the use cases of LLMs is for coding. And you know I use GitHub Copilot all the time. Um, and also as an ML engineer, I don't want to lose track of models as weights, viewing models as these um, fine tunable, uh, mutable artifacts that you can specialize to some certain data set. I don't want to just think of it as a function. And finally, I want to build use tools that support speed, reproducibility, and declarative infrastructure. So again, this is all sort of like my personal take and, and what I want to impart to you in this workshop. And I think doing these three things in, at this time, at this kind of formative time in this space will help you build a kind of deeper understanding. So even if you're an AI engineer who treats models as functions, it's, I think it's still important to learn somewhat a little bit about models as weights. You don't have to dig too deep into deep learning, but I think to play around with um, at least high level frameworks that fine tune LLMs is, is still quite important. And I think using um, production grade sort of reproducible tools that encourage reproducibility is also important because as you're building these products, you, you don't, I think there, there's this trap in the previous generation of just training a bunch of models and like none of it really reaches the light of day. And I think if we have this mindset of product building and having an end user in mind, um, it'll help us sort of create these iterative, these launching pads that we can then iterate on and learn. And hopefully um, we can build tools, products, not just for ourselves as developers, um, but uh, for perhaps our customers, if you're, if you're uh, lucky and, and you work on a project that is software based. So um, for me in this workshop, I would have, I, I, I've always wanted to have maybe a 
a, a tool that assists me when I write flight code, write documentation, write examples, even write, write workshops, workshop content. Um, so the whole point of this workshop will be, again, the title, learning your code base, learning, uh, fine tuning a model on flight using flight itself to train as the orchestration layer. So before I get into the meat of things, I just wanted to give you, I think, a brief introduction to Flight. So Flight is an open source workflow orchestration tool that unifies data, ML, and analytic stacks. And what I mean about this is that it is specialized towards machine learning, and it does support a lot of data processing frameworks like Spark and, and Ray and, and all those that good stuff. Um, and so if we just look at this code snippet, right, it's a very simple um, workflow here. We define one that gets some data and trains a model. And it uses the, the above two functions uh, that are decorated with at task as kind of your building blocks. And then you string them together into more complex workflows with the at workflow decorator. So two things I want to point out here before moving on is that uh, Flight supports sort of this declarative infrastructure, declarative orchestration um, syntax where I'll show you this later, but if I decorate, if I add certain arguments to each component, I unlock certain functionality. So when I say enable deck equals true, as we'll see later, Flight will automatically visualize this on the UI console, um, the data set that is. So you can attach reporting to at the node level of your DAG and get more visibility into the data structures you care about. Um, the, last, the, the last thing I'll point out in this section is that you can also request for resources declaratively. So maybe my train model step requires more than one CPU, where one CPU is the default, and maybe four gigs of memory. So I can ask for that as a ML engineer, data scientist, just in my flight code directly. And flight, the back end, will handle all of the provisioning and grabbing the, the right, correct instances um, for your workload. So then once you've written your code, you can quickly iterate on it with PyFlight Run. Um, so this is a way for you to just quickly you know, run your code. And you can also then easily um, run this on your backend cluster by simply supplying the remote flag. So as we'll see in this GIF, I just add the remote flag, I get a URL, and this will actually send me to sort of a local um, console, a flight cluster that I've configured um, in these recordings. And you can see here that we have a view of all the steps that took place in your workflow. Um, you can look at the inputs and outputs of each of the steps. And you get a few other really nice things um, like a graph view, just to see like a graphical, the graphical topology and also a timeline view to give you like a, some very, very basic um, profiling of your workflow. So with that, I hope, hope this gives you a little bit of a flavor of what flight allows. This, um, just to pause here, is uh, the result of enabling flight decks on that particular task. So here I'm just visualizing like literally the data frame itself. Um, and then when my train, training workflow is completed, I can actually grab the artifact that lives in blob store. So S3, or in this case, min.io, um, we can actually grab the model directly from the flight backend in your Python code. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of how flight works and you know the reproducible and iterative nature of it. Um, all of the all of the nodes in flight graphs and flight workflows are containerized, so they are completely isolated from each other, and um, so. Don't want to delve too deeply into that, but that actually that, that core primitive assumption assumption gives you a lot of nice reproducibility properties. 
So what we're going to build here today, um, I'll show you some of the, the pieces that go into building a custom fine-tuned model and then uh, uh, kind of user-facing interface to access it. And I'll call this project Flight Copilot. It's essentially a software system that takes in a prompt, as you can see here, and then this is you know, what I'll show you a little bit later. It can actually generate um, flight code and documentation. Um, this, uh, this system that we'll be um, going through today will be built on Flight Llama. I used, uh, what is it, stable diffusion here to generate a nice little <laughs> image of a flying llama. Uh, but this will be sort of the base model that will be built on top of Code Llama um, that's fine-tuned on flight repos specifically. And uh, we'll go into that, what that looks like in, in, in a sec. But I did want to take that kind of AI product stack framework that I showed you earlier, and I want to work from the, the top to the bottom, right? So it starts with a use case. It not, doesn't start with a model. It starts with a use case. And so as a flight maintainer, um, I want a tool that helps me write flight examples, code, and documentation. This is a fairly uh, manageable use case because I don't necessarily need an instruction or supervised fine tuning data set. I can just you know, take a, a, a big dump of the flight repo, source code, and documentation, and use that as my next token prediction data set. Obviously, if I have different user stories I want to support, this will have to be different. So for example, a Slack bot that helps flight users uh, will have a higher bar in terms of you know, how it behaves. But this is a pretty good you know, scoping for, for this project so far. So the AI engineering component for this won't be super complicated. There won't be any kind of rag type application here where, you know, but you can certainly build a flight assistant using say like GPT-4 with a kind of rag to reference the, the, the repos. This is not the approach we're taking today. We're actually going to fine tune um, our large language model on the text distribution of flight repos. The ML engineering component of this project will be to essentially deploy that model serving endpoint. And this model serving endpoint has to be able to stream text to a client. And this is kind of a nice user experience requirement because you know, if we're generating many, many tokens, uh, it's not great user experience to have to wait, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds for your text. You want to be able to actually stream the text that's, as it's being generated kind of incrementally. And finally, the ML research kind of component of this is not too heavy either. It's essentially just using a bunch of frameworks, including Hugging Face Transformers, to um, fine tune Code Llama, which is a, you know, a freely available model on flight code and documentation as the data set. Um, so the bulk of this workshop will be kind of a live demo. So um, it'll kind of serve as a way for you to, to code along um, later if, if you want to, but I've sort of designed it to be more sort of lecture style. Uh, but before I get into the actual coding bit, I did want to justify fine tuning and sort of go into some of the techniques that I think if you've attended any of the other talks, they'll probably dive into it much more deeply. Um, so just so everyone's on the same page, here's an LLM, you give it a prompt, it gives you an output. And with prompt engineering, you essentially hold the weights fixed. This is the whole model as a function idea. And you change the prompts in hopes of getting the correct output and response. Um, I guess you can expand prompt engineering more to, I guess, let's call it AI engineering. So that, that would include RAG as well, where you build software systems, vector databases, um, similarity search, uh, all these other components that allow you to 
again, hold the model fixed while manipulating the inputs in such a way and the context in such a way that, you know, if I wanted to generate flight code, for example, I would like take my query, look at my data vector database and find the most relevant pieces and then add that into my context. So hopefully the model will like use that as reference, right? Uh, kind of in between prompt engineering, um, AI engineering and fine tuning or you know, messing around with the model weights is something called prompt tuning. So this is a set, set of techniques where you effectively tune the, the first sort of embedding layer of the la language model against some set of tasks and you optimize the embeddings to do well on those tasks. And finally, fine tuning, which is updating the weights directly um, on a specific data di distribution that you care about. Um, here are a few, there are many more, I'm sure we can think about, but here are a few of the pros and cons of that prompt engineering to fine tuning spectrum. So um, in general, prompt engineering has the benefits of not having to think about or have ML expertise. And with a powerful enough model, you can get quite far, um, as you can probably see on uh, many of the companies being founded today on top of uh, kind of uh, open AI and, and, and the other powerful uh, language models. Um, on the other side, you have fine tuning and, and this does require a lot of work and potentially cost in terms of GPUs. Um, so there is, there is a trade-off here. Um, and I wanted to show you a sort of a high level uh, decision chart that's, again, I don't think you should take too seriously, but uh, you know, so at the top left, we, we start with a question of, you know, have you even tried prompt engineering yet? Or is your data kind of out of distribution of the, the base language model you're using? Um, if you're a system like GPT-4, you've probably seen a lot of the text of the internet, but you do have that cutoff. Um, and so that's, that's sort of like one, one set of decision points that you have is, you know, Prompt engineering, is, I think, in my opinion, is generally like the place to start. Um, but if you can think from first principles that your data is like must be very, very special, um, and the out of the box large language model won't won't really cover that that distribution very well, um, then it's good to uh, try fine tuning. But if you do find yourself doing prompt engineering and and you're like you know trying really hard and you're still not getting the the output that you want, then you know there are a lot of papers now that show that fine tuning uh, for specialized tasks will outperform these generalist models, um, with obviously that trade off of losing gener generality. Um, so, roughly speaking, there are three types of fine tuning. There's con continued pre training, supervised fine tuning, and reinforcement learning from human, human feedback. So CPT is kind of what it sounds like. You just grab a bunch of text from wherever your data source is. Maybe it's proprietary, maybe it's um, you know personal on your computer. Um, and then you just basically treat it as a pile of tokens and uh, you end up with a text completer that does slightly better than the original model on your particular data. Supervised fine tuning requires a prompt response data set. So you'd need to have a high quality data set that maps, you know, write me a flight workflow that uses PyTorch. And um, the response would be that flight code. Right, so um, that's that's sort of a higher bar for SFT, and then for RLHF, it's even higher, where you you have prompt multi-response, uh, a, a prompt multi-response data set with human preferences attached to each response, so you can then um, leverage the whole reward model and and um, RL policy training to train your large language model to say, okay, the, this is to this question, this is like the best type of response. Uh, as I said earlier, the focus of this workshop will be on um, continued pre-training. 
And so with that, I wanted to introduce you to some fine tuning techniques and you may already be somewhat familiar with these. Um, but the, the question I, I like to ask first is, you know, making people appreciate you know, how much memory do I actually need to train a model? And so this diagram shows that I have some, you know, theta parameters and say I'm using the atom optimizer. If I choose to represent those parameters in floating point 32, um, I'll need five times that much memory to actually train my model. And the reason for that is we also have activations and then we also have to keep track of gradients and then the optimizer states, in this case, momentum and variance. So for any given model, just using floating point 32, there's a 5x multiplier when you actually need to train your model. So you can do the back of the envelope calculation if you have a billion parameters and you need 20 gigs of memory. Um, and so you can do that calculation of what actual hardware you need. Over the years, there have been many techniques to train large models. So you can do gradient accumulation, um, model parallelism. So you like shard up your model into the different machines you have available. And there have also been techniques to train models faster. So you have optimizers and schedulers and data parallelism as uh, more established techniques. Then you have things like mixed precision training that allows you to increase the throughput of your system, your training system. And you do this by representing your certain parts of the, the training uh, states as floating point 16. So this decreases the, um, so this increases the throughput, but then also incurs some additional memory uh, overhead because then now you have to keep a full representation um, uh, FP32 versions of your gradients and your parameters uh, for stability reasons. So one way uh, we can kind of, one of the more modern techniques, uh, I suppose, and it's been around for a while still, but quantization is one way we can make our model models during training or inference more um, memory efficient. So quantization, as you can see in this diagram, essentially trades off precision of your numeric representation for memory. And very briefly, let's go through this uh, notebook. You can actually uh, access this on your own time. Um, I'll share all these links later. Um, but just to give you a sense of how quantization works, we're going to implement our own 8-bit quantizer. So as you can see here, the, we're, we're gonna use this technique called abs max. We're basically gonna squash the numbers in, into, in, within, into a certain range. So let me run this. So we have a vector of numbers, right? Um, we're gonna quantize them and represent them as int eight, int eight integers, right? So what we do is apply a scaling factor and we squash those values between, uh, I think, negative one and one, and then we represent that in terms of int eight um, integers. So just to give you a sense of how much memory the original vector and the quantized vector takes, the quantized vector takes half of the memory. Um, we can reverse this operation since we have the scaling factor, we can basically just back out uh, into the original values. However, there will be some loss, and I'll show you that a little bit later. So just to show you, the, uh, the dequantized um, vector is back to 128 bytes. And if we plot these things, right, the original vector is in blue and the dequantized vector is in orange, and it doesn't look too bad, right? However, so you know these are the these are the quantization errors. This is essentially how much of the precision was lost between the original and the dequantized. 
But if you have outliers in your data, so in this case, we're introducing a, a large negative number. We can see now that the quantization error is looks quite large and that that is unacceptable for when you are quantizing um, gradient updates or you know optimizer state updates. So models can be very sensitive to these, these errors. And so as you can see here, the error of that one number was you know, super high. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of an intuition about how quantization works. There is a paper out there, uh, the kind of like the eight bit quantization paper that implements a, a few more interesting tricks that gets around this whole outlier problem. Um, I won't get into that there, but just to show you, um, here's a comparison, I think, of AlexNet trained on ImageNet for the 8-bit and 30-bit um, training runs. And you can see they're, they're quite uh, similar. Cool. So the next fine-tuning technique, so the first Quantization is not a fine tuning technique. It's, it's simply a way to make your uh, inference or training a lot more memory efficient. Um, and you have to do all these tricks to make sure that training or inference is still stable after you lose all of that precision. Um, but low rank adaptation is a, a more recent fine tuning technique that's kind of been popular lately where you essentially do this. So here, here's the kind of background. With regular fine tuning, you're updating all the weights, right? Um, and LoRa is sort of a, low rack adap adaptation is sort of a variation slightly on sort of like freezing most of the weights and, and making the last layer, for example, tunable. Um, so it's sort of on that same thread, but so with regular fine tuning, you update everything, right? And so you have weights W, you, um, you get your weight update, delta W, and then you have your updated weights W prime, right? So this shouldn't be surprising. Um, so now let's reformulate this, right? So if we keep the original pre-trained weights separate and frozen. And we simply have a copy of the weight updates. We mathematically get the same thing, right? So if the new prediction is basically uh, W prime X, uh, there should not be a plus here. That's wrong. Um, this is equivalent to decomposing that, you know, so expanding the, the, the fact the factors. So it's equivalent to Wx plus delta Wx. So why do we want to do this? The formulation for LoRa is you actually factorize the and approximate the weight update matrix into a lower rank uh, set of matrices, two, two matrices that are lower rank. And as long as you make sure that doing a matrix multiplication on, on these two matrices, WA and WB, leads to the same dimensionality of delta W, you should all you should be set, right? So you just make sure that all of these things line up. And this, which contained delta W before, is now WA, WB. And you know, so if this is a you know thousand by thousand matrix, as long as the the matrix multiplication of these two matrices is a thousand by thousand, um, you should have a kind of a lower capacity approximation of what that original weight update would have been. So the intuition here is that you're trading off model capacity for um, sort of parameter efficiency of your model. So to give you a sense here, we'll do a little bit of a notebook sidebar. This will be the last one for this workshop. Um, you can go to go.flight.org slash Laura Notebook if you want to play around with it yourself. Um, but in terms of performance, 
at least in, in certain tasks, Laura has been shown to be, you know, competitive with full fine tuning. So that's an interesting um, empirical observation. Oh, let me reconnect to my runtime. So in this notebook, we're gonna actually implement some Laura layers ourselves. So gonna import a bunch of stuff from PyTorch. Um, here's a bunch of boilerplate code to train MNIST. Um, not super interesting, um, but here's the interesting part. So let's implement a very simple you know, multi-layer perceptron. Just use a bunch of linear layers and ReLUs. And let's go ahead and just train this. Um, I think I'm using a GPU, so. Oh, wow. All oh, right, I need to run this. Great. Curse of the demo won't get me today. Uh, while this is running, I see a question in the Laura approach. We won't be updating all weights, rather low rank weights. Yes, correct. Um, I did not mention that explicitly, but if we go back to the slides, uh, this blue, you know, weight matrix on on this side will be uh, frozen. Um, and as far as I know, ten percent or something like that. Yes, you can. You, that that's that's a parameter. That's a hyperparameter. So you can have a rank that's equivalent to this, the the original weight matrix itself. Um, but you know. You don't get anything out of that. OK, so we've trained our kind of vanilla model here. You know, we get an 89% accuracy on the test set. It's fine. Um, so now let's, let's create a LoRa linear layer. So here I'm defining a class, a PyTorch module. And it accepts a linear layer. And all it does is create our WA and WB matrix as empty matrices, right? We're saying that you know we we keep track of the input dimension and output dimension of the original layer, so that's that's like these are numbers that we need. And the one hyperparameter here is rank. So the lower rank is so if we choose say eight or ten um, compared to you know a rank hundred that you're going to get a much lower capacity model, but it may not matter for your fine tuning data set. Um, we initialize the weights. And then in our forward pass, all, all we're doing is literally, this is that formula I showed you earlier. Um, I'm actually freezing this the original weights, right? So uh, just note that in our original linear layer, we're saying requires grad is false. So these weights are frozen. And then we're adding to it x multiplied by the product of wa and wb. Let's go ahead and run this. I uh, have a little helper function here to sort of like swap out layers um, out of a, like a, the vanilla model. So um, let us train our LoRa model. So this should take a few more seconds. But what we're going to do next is just prove to you that it is a lower capacity model um, in this particular case. So you know, same number of epochs, um, and we get 76% performance and accuracy. Um, Subramaniam, yes, the notebooks will be shared. I'll have a slide at the end. And here's some code to just show you what the trainable parameters are. So in the original model, we had about 100,000 trainable parameters. In our LoRa model, we had 20,000. And so that's a reduction of about 5 point so x. Um, again, you can reduce this rank parameter, and that will decrease your model capacity even further. Um, and yeah, now if we plot the losses, we can see that uh, Losses model in the blue is the original uh, model, and it converges much more much more quickly than the Laura model. Okay, great. So, yeah, play around with this notebook. You know, uh, build build your intuition about you know how this how this works. 
Okay. So the last thing I'll mention here about LoRa is there is a, a newer variant on it called QLoRa. The uh, main differences are that you can quantize the LoRa weights. Um, so QLoRa quantizes LoRa, the LoRa weights using a four-bit um, normal float representation, which is even less um, memory used by your LoRa weights. It also performs double quantization. I won't get into this too much, but remember in the quantization notebook, we kept the, the scaling factor, so we could actually squash, you know, normalize the, the original vectors into the quantized. So double quantization is also quantizing those constants as well, those, those scaling factors. So we're just like squeezing as much uh, memory out of our machines. And then it also does something called uh, CPU paging. So for, for optimizer weights, so as you can see in this right-hand panel, um, this is supposed to handle sort of uh, memory, p memory spikes in the optimizer during training. Um, so it can offload some of those to CPU um, so that you don't get those nasty out of memory errors. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some lay of the land of some of the techniques. Those are obviously just two of them. There are a ton more. Um, yeah, flash attention, there's deep speed, uh, uh, distributed, you know, fully distributed data parallel, things like this, um, or so, sorry, fully sharded data parallel. Um, but we won't get into that in this workshop. Great, so, okay, just looking at the questions. Um, can you use different precisions for the original model weights and LoRa weights during training? Yeah, you can. So I think the papers, like, so the LoRa and QLoRa papers themselves have some recommendations on what those should be. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I think generally speaking for the original weights, you do want as much precision as possible. I think you can use floating point 16 for those. Um, and then for LoRa weights, you use, you know, this uh, orbit representation. Um, so yeah, you can see, you can see that here. With QLoRa, you're using four bit everywhere. With regular LoRa, you're using 16 bit um, representation um, for your base model. Awesome, so here's the overall flight copilot v0 architecture. We're basically gonna create a data set, pull a bunch of files from GitHub. We're then gonna use QLoRa to fine tune our model. Um, some of the dependencies here, I just wanna call out, you know, good old PyTorch, transformers, the PEFT library, which is a parameter efficient fine tuning library by Hugging Face, <clears throat> and bits and bytes, which is a library um, for you know, quantization that, that's super awesome um, by, I believe, Tim Detmers um, and others, of course. So from there, we're gonna publish our uh, model onto the Hugging Face Model Hub, just as a kind of publicly available open source model, um, obviously subject to Code Llama license stuff. Um, we're then gonna build our model server using Mosec, which is a, um, I think it's a more recent entrant in the whole model serving space. Um, fairly easy to use and, and um, learn. And then we're gonna build and deploy our model using Model Z, and we're gonna host it on Model Z, which is, um, I believe, a serving platform built by the Mosec team to host um, various models. So we're gonna use that to, to host our Flight Llama model and um, stream text over to a HTTP client using HTTPX and this other helper library, HTTPX SSE for server-side events. So that gets us the nice streaming UX that we wanted in the beginning. So Mert, the question here, yeah, feel free to keep asking questions, I'll, I'll kind of pause. 
Um, we have plenty of time for, the, for this workshop, so um, I'll pause for questions. So, so with this system, it's purely the model doing the uh, kind of quote unquote reasoning. So there's no, with this system here itself, there is no rag architecture that uses uh, a vector database or some, some kind of database to reference like the raw text itself. So in this case, we're relying on this, oops, we're relying on this fine tuned QLora step um, to completely learn the text distribution of, of the flight code base and documentation. And the, the prompt provided by the client will simply be auto-completed. So there is no instruction or sort of like special data set that this has been trained on, just pure uh, text completion. Um, I will get in the end to sort of like iterations on top of this that may use RAG. All right, so without further ado, let's, let's get building. So I'll break this up into kind of four sections. The first section is data set creation, then we'll fine tune, we'll deploy and serve our model, and then we'll see what the client CLI looks like. So let me pull up my editor and my terminal. Hopefully you can see these two things and the text is large enough. So just to orient everyone, I'm currently in the LLM fine tuning repo. This repo is open source, um, hands on flight, and it runs on a flight cluster. So, you know, those are the prereqs for this. Um, and we'll spend most of our time in this flight llama directory um, where a lot of our code is. Um, Just to give you a brief peek into what this contains, um, the main code base is under this Flight Llama Python module. It has all the pieces we need. We have some configuration that I'll show you later. And then there's a bunch of Docker files and requirements files that uh, we'll sort of touch, touch on um, as we need to. OK. so. The first and arguably most important step is data set creation. And actually found some bugs in preparation for this workshop. So yeah, the conference driven development is all not all bad. Um, the first thing we'll do is we'll actually just run this data set script locally, right? So um, this data set is just a couple of repos worth of text files, so it's not going to be a large data set. Um, flight itself is composed of many different components, as you can see here. Flight itself is the main repo, but it is supported by our Python SDK called FlightKit um, and many other repos. Uh, I don't have time to get into each of these. Flight Propeller is like the main execution engine that runs on Kubernetes. Um, console is our UI. Admin is the control plane that communicates um, with uh, the, the console and does, has a lot of other different responsibilities. So uh, we have a handful of repos. We are going to grab the files with these extensions. Uh, we are interested in a lot in Python because that is where a lot of the user code is written. Um, but we do also want to train it on Go, which is a, where a lot of the backend is written, and a lot of configuration, which is in YAML and um, JSON. So we're just going to throw the kitchen sink of, of flight repos at it and see what happens. Um, the script itself is super simple. All it does is iterates through each of these URLs, grabs the GitHub documents for each of them, um, that, you know, have those extensions and have, you know, like the allow kind of include files, exclude files, um, criteria. So essentially we're just grabbing a bunch of files is the point. And I'm just going to run this flight llama data set. I'm just going to output it. 
somewhere here in my local machine. And as you can see, it's a bunch of files. Cool. Uh, I had to do some bash, actually use ChatGPT for this, but um, just to give you a sense of how many files are in each of these repos, um, there are the most files in the main flight repo. Um, and then obviously it kind of tapers off. Flight kit is flight kit and flight snacks. Flight snacks is our documentation. These are where a lot of the user facing kind of code would live. Um, okay, to give you a sense of the extension counts, most of the files are JSON. Um, a good number of them are Python. Still many more are Go. And then it it um, it peters off from there. Um, a lot of our documentation is mark in Markdown. I'm surprised this isn't, isn't higher. Uh, I need to look at that. Okay, great. So it's always useful to know what your data actually looks like. I mean, I've seen flight code before, but to give you a sense, um, I'm going to use a data loader that uh, the, training, uh, the training function uses. So um, simple data loader, we're just gonna iterate through each of those files. We're gonna chunk them up in si blocks of, you know, block size. In this case, the default is 1024. And then we're just gonna kind of do a sliding window. So we skip every 128 tokens, you know. Um, and so from here, I'm gonna open up a REPL real quick. Um, import our data, get data set function. Just ignore this warning. This is a bits and bytes warning. Um, it's just complaining that there's no GPU available. Um, okay, and then we're gonna get our data set. And I'm gonna print out the first sample. So this looks like it's from probably, I'm not sure, GRPC. This might be flight admin, but or actually flight kit. So so here's, you know, yeah, these are these are the tokens we're gonna use, right? So here's a few more examples of what this looks like. Right, there's a, you know. Um, JSON configuration here, you get the idea. Um, some tests, right? So this is flight kit tests. Um, and now let's just tokenize it just for fun. Um, we're gonna get a bunch of integers out, but you know. Okay, so let's tokenize first data set. And so this is what our model sees during training. It's a bunch of integers that are, um, the, the token indexes based on the tokenizer. Cool. Okay. So now let's go ahead and fine tune our model, right? We have our data set, it lives here. Yeah, Mert, this is, uh, this is a great point, right? So chunking a data set is not really straightforward. There's a bunch of, yeah. There's, there's a, a lot of different code splitting kind of chunking logic out there that's, I know there are, there are ones that are language specific. So you actually chunk it up into kind of logical blocks of code. Uh, I guess AST parsing and training on that. Um, I know that's kind of like, I've heard that is another approach. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. This is simply a very naive way of doing it. Um, great, so we have our data set. Let us fine tune. And with for that, we're gonna use our little training script here. Um, just wanna walk through it briefly. So our main entry point is this train function and it takes in a trainer config data class. It has a bunch of options on it. We'll look, look at one of a 
an example that we're going to use. Um, we load our tokenizer in our model. It's all pretty standard. Um, we're going to use bfloyd16 if there's a GPU, av a GPU available. Um, just to call out the bits and bytes configuration here to load the model in 4-bit. So this is the whole QLORA setup. Um, and then we're going to use this paged AdamW 8-bit optimizer. And there might be a 4-bit optimizer available these days. Um, and then here's our LoRa configuration for um, loading up our model with then with the adapter weights kind of on the side. So this is all wonderful framework stuff that's built by Hugging Face and others uh, just to make this super straightforward. Um, and finally, we just supply the training arguments and then call trainer.train. The magic happens. And let's, let's do this locally now. So I have a local configuration that I know will work. And this is actually not Flight Llama. So this is a misnamed configuration file. Um, but we're going to use the Pythia 70 million model just when I run this locally so I don't blow up my computer. Um, and this config file we're going to use now in our flight workflow. So as I showed you earlier, there's a bunch of stuff here. I'm going to kind of walk you through it. Um, don't worry, these are not actually the keys. These are just um, uh, the names of the, the secrets. So, you know, don't think you can uh, <laughs> copy this for uh, weights and biases se secret key. Um, so we're going to import flight kit, and then we're going to import flight llama, which is a bunch of the code I showed you just now. Um, and this is a kind of a nice pattern. So I'm going to like define a bunch of my modules just as vanilla Python. And then when I'm ready to use flight, I'm just going to use a dedicated workflows.py file. And this is where a lot of my kind of like orchestration specific logic is going to live. Um, so let's start out at the training workflow. Oh yeah, th these are not actually keys. These are just the, the names, um, the, not the values. Um, so this is this is totally fine, but yes, uh, for even for these, probably worth using environment um, variables. Um, so with the training workflow, it's very simple. We're simply going to call create dataset, and um, and then feed that dataset into this train task, and then output a model. So as you can see, flight takes type hints seriously. And so config here is annotated with trainer config. Uh, Pre-trained adapter, not super important for now. But if you want to uh, continue pre-training from a previous adapter checkpoint, this is uh, something you would supply. Um, but the important thing to note here is that these, these kind of types, right? So workflow outputs a flight directory. And so that implies the output of train as a flight directory. So let's take a look at that. So flight has abstractions for strongly typed containerized orchestration. So what this means is that this task at task decorated function will actually run on its own pod, its own container on Kubernetes. Not super important for you to know, Kubernetes super deeply, but just think of each task running at its own kind of container so that it's not, you're not at risk of like messing around with any of the state or dependencies of any other tasks running in your graph. Um, but when you write flight code, it, it looks as if it's local and it, you can actually run this stuff locally. Um, so we effectively do a bunch of setup but the main thing to note here is we're just calling site llama dot train dot train, which is that function I showed you earlier. Um, and the output of this actually is it's gonna 
dump all of the model artifacts into config.output directory. So that's already been, been configured here. And what flight will do actually is locally, it'll just run things, right? As if they were local, which is the case. But when you're running this on a flight cluster, flight will actually take the model files and artifacts in this directory and throw them onto the configured blob store, in this case, S3. It also does this with the data set, right? So flight really abstracts away deseriali deserialization and serialization logic from like passing data and models from one task to the next. And it really just looks like Python code. So a few other things I want to call out here. It's quite the, the structure of the, the workflows are quite simple actually, but there are a few bells and whistles that flight offers and exposes through the at task decorator. Mainly that you can cache things, right? So um, assuming that your function code is idempotent, if you give it the same input, you should get the same output. And so flight will know about this and you won't have to like retrain your model if you give it the same exact inputs. You can also give it an image spec. What this image spec is, is an abstraction of Docker such that you don't have to think about Docker images. There's a few moving pieces here, right? But all I'm saying is I want Git to be available since my requirements.txt file actually doesn't use Git. So actually you can get rid of this Good for now. Um, here's the registry that I want to push this image to once it's built. Um, here are my Python dependencies, Python version, CUDA version, and some other uh, environment variables I want available in this image. Right, so now that I've declared it's here, all I have to do to say look, what my dependencies of each task are is I just pass it into container image and flight will know, you know, I can have a different image for create data set. Obviously I'm using the same one, but I can have different images for different tasks um, and, you know, handle dependencies in a granular form this way. Um, next thing I'll call out here is resources. So we're actually gonna use an 8X T4 um, instance here with um, T4 GPUs. So as I saw you, I, I showed you earlier, we can request for resources directly um, declaratively here in our flight code. So we're asking for eight GPUs and a bunch of memory and ephemeral storage. Um, I can inject some environment variables also here that are not super sensitive. And here are the secret requests that I'm making that are, excuse me, specific to just this train task. Um, so as you, as you saw above here, these are just the names of the secrets. Um, so this we'll use uh, in the back AWS secrets manager, but it can be configured for other secrets managers. Okay, so that is a lot of talking. Let me do some showing. Um, let's run this locally first. So I'm going to use PyFlight Run. PyFlight Run is a way for you to run workflows uh, and tasks kind of directly, right? So, okay, Mert, um, we'll see you later. Great, so let's provide the path to the workflows file. And let's do this. Let's call train workflow. Give it a, a configuration. So let's use flight mama local. Uh, where is it? 7 billion local. So now this is actually going to create the data set in the create data set step um, and train the model locally. So this is the same. Output you saw earlier. Okay. 
It'll take just a few more seconds. Yeah, totally, uh, Nick. This is um, flight is in the same product category as Airflow or Dagster or Prefect, right? So we're we're all we're all in the same space. We all have somewhat different opinions of doing for how uh, how to do things and syntax. Um, and yeah, uh, but at the end of the day, it they solve kind of similar problems. It's just um, what kind of flavor of orchestrator you prefer. So now we're going to the, into the train model training step. And here I've just configured it to go for 20 update steps. So this should complete pretty quickly. Um, but as, as you can see, what Flight allows is you can write this stuff locally and you can run them locally. Uh, and then the next step, I'm going to show you how you can actually run this on a Flight cluster. Um, so this improves debugging because essentially with the kind of a functional flavor of orchestrator, you can just, you know, treat these functions as just local regular Python functions. You can have unit tests around them. You can have all the good, nice kind of software engineering practices around your uh, workflows. Um, okay, so our local run has completed. And next, I'll show you how to run this on a remote flight cluster. So it's going to copy this command in. I'll break it down, but it effectively the same command I ran earlier. It just has a different config file. So this will actually use code llama. The main difference here is I'm passing in this remote flag. And I've already configured my local shell to, to run on a particular flight cluster. So if I run this, what it's going to do is it's going to look at the image spec that my tasks depend on. And because I've pre-built this image already, it's skipping the build step. Um, if I add new requirements, it'll rebuild and repush. Um, but now let me head on over to the execution that we just kicked off. So just to orient you, this is Union Cloud. This is essentially a Union Cloud hosted flight cluster. Um, just for a little preamble on this, Union Cloud is effectively um, kind of a managed version of flight. So um, this allows you to uh, not worry too much about the infrastructure and simply write your flight code and execute them on a fully managed cluster. Um, so as you can see, we are using the data set cache because I haven't really updated the data set. So this pretty much succeeded um, immediately. And now this training job is queued. I actually have one baking already for you that's been running for 14 hours. So I did want to orient you here, right? So here's our very simple execution graph and our timeline. Um, Obviously, most of it is being spent on the training step. Um, and here I can actually look at the utilization pattern of this training node, right? So we get some visibility. And this is you know, the very basic of what we can show of um, how much CPU utilization and memory utilization um, you're using and on the GPU side as well. So as you can see here, we're not too super maxed, but we're, we're pretty, we're using it, you know, pretty much at capacity. Um, and you can see the utilization here is quite spiky. So it, it goes up to 100 each, for each node at a given time. And that is because um, with the, the current implementation of QLora, we have to use, uh, uh, threaded version of data parallel. So um, this is, we're sharding the model up into eight bits. And then um, every time you do a, a forward pass or inference on this, it's going to have to you know, pass around the activations across all the different machines. 
which is why you're seeing this kind of spiky pattern. Um, you can also view the logs over here. Um, this is just helpful for debugging. And um, you can also see the inputs and outputs in this particular view. So this is give you, it gives you a sense of how flight, you know, how you would interact with flight and then sort of get the information you need to sort of debug and optimize your workloads. All right, so this is, I think there was a question earlier how long this takes. So for this particular setup, um, one epoch will run for about a day and a half to two days. Um, so there are, are many optimizations on top of this to, to kind of speed this up, but that's, that's what we got. Um, dipping into the questions a little bit, uh, where is the image built local? So yes, so if this were not already pre-built, it would be built locally and then pushed to your registry of choice. Um, in this case, I'm pushing up to GitHub container registry. Um, so this assumes that you're, you're authenticated correctly to the, your registry. Um, great. So one thing I missed actually was you can actually link these to weights and biases. So, you know, the observability part of Union Cloud and Flight is sort of, it gives you some information, but not a whole lot. And to kind of look at, oh, where am I? Yes. But to see sort of the training, uh, training loss and the eval loss, we can use uh, weights and biases. Um, and so you can see, keep track of your training run this way. And so the way this happens here is that we are essentially just using weights and biases and you know, authenticating with a, a secret key here and then using that um, under the hood with transformers, a transformers library. Okay, cool. So the next step here is to publish actually, you know, to actually publish our model. And the way we're gonna do this is we are going to use this publish model workflow. And all we're gonna do is give it the model directory. So in this case, an S3 path and a configuration file. Um, and let's use an already completed workflow. So let's use this guy. This is a workflow that's already done. This is the S3 path. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna call the published model workflow and provide this. So this is also gonna kick off another, kick off, kick off another run. And uh, this step was already cached, actually. So we can head over to the outputs, and this will be actually the Hugging Face Hub um, model entry for this. So um, kind of a bare model card for now, but these, this is the adapter-specific weights, right? So um, it's not going to contain the base model, but it does have the base model referenced in the adapter config. OK, so now I need to hurry up and show you how to actually serve this thing. Um, so in this case, I am going to show you the server file. And so this, this server uses Mosaic, as I mentioned earlier. So Mosaic is a model serving library um, it's pretty easy to use. The main thing is this worker class, and you define an init, which is which kind of configures, you know, at app startup time, what you need, like your pipeline, your model, your tokenizer, and a, a forward method, which essentially takes in some data, and you know does some stuff and returns an output, right? Um, so if I were to start the server locally, I can just go ahead and do that. Uh, 
Um, actually, before I do this, actually this will blow my computer up. I am going to, again, swap this out. And say max gen lengths, uh, I only want 100 tokens. So now this is running. Um, I'm going to make a request, post request to this endpoint. I'm just going to have it autocomplete. Flight is a. And obviously, this is just Pythia 70 million. So it just loves talking about movies. I don't know, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but so that's you know the debugging local debugging story for for Mozak. Um, let me revert this. And tear down the server. So for our application, we actually want a streaming uh, event type service. So for that, we're gonna use the server SSE file. And it's essentially the same as the regular server file. The main difference is that we're gonna, gonna iterate through a bunch of turns and generate n tokens per turn and send those as a streaming event, right? So this class, um, SSE worker exposes this nice method that if you use a streaming client, you can get that kind of user experience where we're streaming text. So I'm gonna kind of rush this. I'm gonna build and push a Docker image that already exists, so that's fine. And I'm going to use this deploy script. So this is a Model Z deployment script that uses their API, cloud.modelz.ai. And I'm going to pass in a bunch of configuration. But the main things to note are the image that we just built. Um, so that image. Is here, it just installs a bunch of the requirements and sets the entry point to the server SSE module. And we're gonna use uh, four L4 instances. So that's plenty of memory. And we're gonna end up with a deployment key. And I don't want to spend too much time waiting for this service to start up. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a different endpoint, but before that, let me show you what Model Z looks like, right? So this is the endpoint we just deployed. Um, there's one that's already ready to use, um, but it's a, a fairly nice and clean platform. You can sort of deploy these endpoints. You can access them through, um, this URL endpoint here. Um, you can deploy things from templates. Um, great. So from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that pre-baked um, endpoint. And I'm going to ask it to autocomplete this code snippet below, shows a basic flight workflow decoration. Um, so as you can see, you know, not as fast as chat GPT, uh, obviously it's a little, it can, it can be optimized. Um, but here is our application. We essentially have now have a client, which is over here. This is the client I just used. Give it some arguments and it will auto complete flight code for you. So let's try another one. Uh, Let's see, any suggestions? Any, any burning questions about flight? Uh, here is a flight workflow that uses the Ray task config plugin. Okay, get some URLs here. I don't even know if this is valid. Nope. Okay, so you get the idea. This is uh, 
model that probably needs a, a lot more training and probably needs more kind of specialized data to sort of get get the uh, customer service type bot interaction. But this, as you can tell, it does do its best. It no, does know about workflows. It does know about certain things uh, in flight to be able to uh, text complete. Great. So with 10 minutes left, I want to hop back to my slides and just wrap up here. So from what you saw, there are like a lot of optimizations we can do. One thing we can do is we can merge the QLoRa weights back into the base model. Um, because in truth, LoRa actually does incur an additional inference time cost. Because you have your frozen weights, and then you have these side weights. And you have to do a forward pass on two, both of them. Um, Hopefully, the lower weights are the adapter weights are not that heavy, so it's not that bad. Um, but you know, if we did want to squeeze more performance, we just kind of merge the weights back into the original model. Could also use a faster inference framework like VLLM or text inference generation, a hugging face library, um, flash attention. There are a lot of options here. Could also expand our data set to repos that have FlightKit as the as a dependency. So this would capture maybe more in the wild type code that, that people write. And then of course, we can always experiment with you know, full weight fine tuning and using larger base models. So the roadmap for this project is not set in stone, um, but this is part of my work at Union AI to sort of both use our products and build useful stuff for us um, internally and also for our customers. So the next immediate step here would, for example, be writing a VS Code flight copilot extension. There are a few requirements here that are not currently captured, like uh, supporting fill in the middle of completion, right? So if you're if you have two code blocks here and you're typing kind of in the middle, there is a, a simple data augmentation technique called fill in the middle in this paper um, that allows you to do that. And there's a handy hugging face framework called LLM VS Code that allows you to integrate this um, with VS Code nicely. Um, for Slack bot, um, which we've dubbed flight attendant, it's going to be a little bit harder because the quality of the data set will be much, need to be much higher. Um, essentially, the, the supervised fine tuning or instruct type data sets that, that you might have seen. Um, but so that, that, that would be a, a, a further future step after a kind of more developer based tool. And so just to leave you with some takeaways. I uh, just want to show you this kind of like way of thinking about this AI product uh, stack. And wanted to remind you that, you know, it's still early days. It's, there's a lot of the best practices that are being pulled from software engineering and databases and other areas um, are still happening today, right? So we have frameworks, um, uh, I guess, so... Langchain would be the one of the most popular ones, uh, Llama Index, many others in the AI engineering space, and then obviously still in the ML engineering, ML research um, space as well. So I think if you're an ML engineer or data scientist, it's, it's good to go through the motions of fine tuning your own LLMs, seeing what works, what doesn't work, what kinds of data sets um, you need for the behavior you want. Um, and again, picking frameworks and tools that support speed of iteration, reproducibility, and declarative infrastructure so that you know you don't have just a graveyard of just random model models that don't have any code or infrastructure um, backing them. Um, here are a bunch of resources. I'll share the slides in the Union AI uh, sponsor page. Uh, I'll share all these links. You can reach out to me on the Whova app as well, on the Union AI, or on my direct messages if you have any questions. Um, here are my kind of socials. And just want to 
do, do a call out to come talk to us. We have a booth um, at the event, so booth 23. Um, you know, give us a star on flight, uh, enter a raffle to win some nice things. I personally am coveting these uh, nice wireless headset. And finally, uh, join us for drinks uh, later this evening, so 7 to 9 p.m. CST at Austin Beer Works. Uh, capacity is unlimited, but drink tickets will be distributed at a first come, first serve basis. You can register here. We'll also add this link to the Union AI sponsor page. And you can yeah stay updated on this page. Uh, we'll give you updates. And again, if you had any other questions for me, either reach out to me on this, the chat over there, the right hand side, or um, just uh, DM me on the the Whova app. Awesome. And with that, I wanted to thank you for your attention. I hope you got a little something out of this. Um, you can, you know, take this code, adapt it, use a different orchestrator, do whatever you want. Um, but hopefully it gives you a sense of how to fine tune your own models and serve them on a reliable, scalable infrastructure. Okie dokie, I will drop off, but yes, please feel free to come reach me at the app. Um, I'm actually not at the event, so uh, if you had any more questions, please go there. Thanks all, bye.